will. To Acts chapter 21. Lord willing, we'll be looking into verses 1 through 17. And also take note of this, that verses 1 through 17 will be looking into us. Because the word of God is powerful and alive. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your love. And I thank you for your beautiful presence here with us today. I pray your hand of blessing would be on each one here. Holy Spirit, please be the teacher. Please highlight and enlighten us in your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and everybody says. As I was uh, studying this week, I came across a couple of reference verses for what we're studying. And uh, they just stuck with me. Ever read a couple of verses that just stick with you or a verse that just sticks with you? You know that song we just say, your goodness is you know, following, it's running after me. Sometimes a verse will run after you. Have you had that experience where everywhere you turn, you keep hearing that same verse again, you know? You flip on the radio, there's that same verse again. You go to church and the pastor's teaching that same, and you go, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> You know, just tune in when that happens, because that happened to me, and it really, I believe, fits in with the verses that we're looking at today, and I believe it also fits in with Communion Sunday, and that's Psalm 51, verse 10. Matt, I think this is one of your favorites, if I'm not mistaken. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's one that stuck to me. Here's the other one. Psalm 57, verse 7, which says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. And of course, the word that sticks out to me in both those reference verses is the word steadfast. I think that if there was a Christian motto, which there isn't, but the Christian motto is the whole of the Bible. <laughs> How about that? But if there were some type of a Christian motto, I think it would for sure include that word, steadfast. You know, the Olympics are coming up. You aware of that? And uh, the Olympics have a motto. You know what the, oh, here's your quiz for today. What's the uh, Olympic motto? And I see some people Googling, so I'll need to tell you real quick. The Olympic motto is swifter, higher, stronger. It's pretty good. It fits them, doesn't it? But what fits us is being steadfast. Now, whenever the Bible uses the word steadfast, it is speaking about being firm being unwavering in your faith. And I'll talk a little bit more about steadfast in a moment. But listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. I like that. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is is not in vain in the Lord. It's a long haul. It's a long run. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So be steadfast. Be assured in your own mind. I'm not going to step back. I've given my life to Christ. I have been bought with a price. Therefore, I am going to follow him without backing up. No rear view mirror Christianity. Sometimes we call it keep on, keeping on. Uh, I watched a uh, National Geographic uh, animal kind of show. Anybody like those? See, good, all right. Anybody don't like them? My wife will raise her hand right away. She does not like them. Does not like them. She'd much rather be watching a Hallmark show. So please, pray for us. <laughs> So I'm watching this uh, show, and they're doing a special on a cheetah. And what a remarkable animal the cheetah is. And they've been clocked at over 70 miles an hour. 
Can you imagine driving on the freeway and a cheetah just passes you by? You know? <laughs> What's that? But in order for them to feed their young, the great tool that they have is their speed. And that's how they catch prey, and that's how they feed their young. But did you know that a cheetah can only keep up that fast rate of speed for maybe a minute? That's it. They, they have, in comparison to the size of the body of a cheetah, they have a very small heart. And uh, there are some experts that even think uh, that the cheetah holds its breath while it's, while it's uh, chasing after a prey. Because you'll watch it, and then if it missed the jump, then it will just quit and have to go back and lay down and rest. Now, why do I mention this? I want to tell you this. That there are some believers who live their Christian faith like a cheetah. They get all excited about something, and they go charging after it, but they quickly fade. They stop before the race is over. They give up too early. And they want to go back, find a nice shady tree with shade under it, just rest, take a nap. We are in a long haul. We are in a battle even. I would say that to a great degree, uh, those believers who run their Christian race like a cheetah, uh, in some ways they actually have an easier life. Yeah, I, I think so. The reason why I say that is because the enemy is not going to bother them. If you hear a teaching about demonic oppression or demonic temptations or, you know, demons rattling your cage, and you sit there and say, gee, that never happens to me then I would say you might be going in the wrong direction. You might be taking a nap when you should be up working for the Lord. Amen? Amen. So uh, that's what I have to say about steadfastness. Um, Don't fizzle out. It's a long haul. And uh, look, the, the answers to you making a long haul in your Christianity and finishing stronger than when you started it's, it doesn't have anything to do with you making your promises to God. Just forget that. It, it's not got to do with what labor you have done, you know. It's got to do with you responding to what God has already done. I'm just a responder. God's done all the work. He's done all the effort. I just continually forever respond to him. For the rest of my life, Lord willing, I will be a giant thank you card. To God. And I'll live my life in a way that people can read that thank you card and pick up something about God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be a blessing? Steadfastness, it means being solid. It means being resilient. It means being committed. It means no quitting. It means having God as your priority above all else and running on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So what I want us to do today is to look at a, what steadfast Christianity looks like. And we have a beautiful example of steadfast Christianity. Where we pick it up today, the Apostle Paul is closing out his third missionary trip. We're getting close to the end of the book of Acts. I know, is that something? And as he's closing out the third missionary trip, you recall from last week, it was very, for me, it was very touching because I literally put myself in the scene. And Paul the Apostle is in Miletus, and it's several miles away from Ephesus. And he calls for the leaders of the church, and they all come out. They're standing around the shore. The, The ship's off to the side here, and Paul begins to tell them, how much he loves them. And he he tells them, I I don't know that you're going to see my face again. This is it. And they have tears and they're just... And I looked at that and I thought, my goodness, that's what God wants, that love within a fellowship, that we care that much, that deeply about each other, that we're willing to get in, 
involved in each other's lives, that we're willing to pull each other along. As Daniel likes to uh, say with the young adults, make sure that you have a Paul the Apostle to lean on and make sure you find yourself a Timothy, somebody that you can bring along in the faith. What a great way to live for our whole lives. So Paul the Apostle, he's on his way to Jerusalem and the reason why he's on his way to Jerusalem and he wants to get there in a hurry because he wants to come to the Feast of Pentecost. He wants to celebrate with them that feast. He wants to, I think, remember when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples in the upper room on Pentecost. It's a really exciting time. So he wants to greet the brethren there. He also, with all the churches that he's been hopping from, you know, teaching and and, uh, giving good counsel, he has taken up a collection. And he's going to take that collection back to the believers in uh, Jerusalem. The reason why they're having such a hard time is because those that have given them their lives to Christ are not only being given a bad time by the Romans, the Romans like to say Caesar is Lord, uh, the believers know that Jesus is Lord, and also a bad time from the Jews who are giving them all kinds of grief for accepting Christ as their Messiah. So Paul wants to get back there for those reasons. Uh, for Pentecost, for love, for this offering that he wants to bring. Um, if you've been away for church, from church for a while, and I know we're going on year three with this lockdown business, and a lot of people have not come to church, and I know that there's an online church, and God bless the online folks. We're happy to have you with us. But there's something about being with a group of people and worshiping. Wouldn't you agree? It's just a totally different experience. You know, you can worship online. It's great. But when you're here and you look across to people and you realize that God has us in the cup of his hand, it's just something special. So hopefully uh, restrictions won't be along too much longer and things will mellow out, Lord willing. A lot of us are praying for just that. So Paul the Apostle wants to see these people he loves face to face. He loves the Jews. At one time, he was a Pharisee, right? And when he was a Pharisee, what was his name? Yeah, Saul. Saul of Tarsus. So Paul wants to speak to them about putting faith in Jesus Christ. He wants to tell them all about the exciting things that are happening uh, all through that region and all up into Asia and the wonderful work that God did and has done in Ephesus. And so, interesting thing, everybody is telling Paul, don't go back to Jerusalem. Everybody is saying to him, stay here. Even people are prophesying. Thus says the Lord, it's going to be rough. You're not going to like it. They're trying to dissuade Paul from going back to Jerusalem. But you know what he's doing? He said, no, 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 I already heard from the Lord. So I'm going to where God has sent me. Talk about being steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what it looks like. And he was not to be dissuaded from that. So please follow along now as I read Acts chapter 21, verses 1 all the way down to 17. And see what you find interesting about these verses. Now, when it came to pass that when he had departed from them, that's the folks in Miletus, and he set sail, got on a ship, <clears throat> running a straight course, we came to cause the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara, and finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us. 
with wives and children till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those that at that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem, then Paul answered, Why do you, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem, also with some of the disciples from Caesarea, went with us. We brought with them a certain Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The word of the Lord. Now, I know that in just reading this, a lot of folks might just pass over it. But do I do that? <laughs> Not a chance. I know that there is meat in here, vegetables and things that help us to grow in our faith where we can actually look at what it means to be steadfast in following God. So let's see, after reading this, let me ask you a question. Who, who here would have liked to have been Paul's travel agent? <laughs> How many pages do you think that would have taken? <laughs> you get off on this ship, and then you go to that ship, and when you're done with that ship, you go to this ship, and then you wait there. Oh my goodness. How many would have said after two or three ship uh, you would have said, uh, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Let's, you know, this looks like a nice place to stay. But not Paul the Apostle. I don't think that this bothered him one bit. I think it would have bothered us. I think it would bother me. All those changing flights, so to speak. I think I would have just been tuckered out, you know. But not him. All those layovers, yeah. Uh, how about this? Do you notice then the steadfastness of the Apostle Paul. You see, a lot of people will stand before you and they'll talk about what, what a theologian Paul the Apostle was. Yeah, 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 he was a theologian. A lot of people will talk about you, how smart he was. He was probably one of the most brilliant men, you know, in the category of men that have lived. Paul the Apostle would be right up there. They would talk about his writing ability. They'd talk about his study habits that he would able, was able to pull so many things from the Old Testament and connect them to our life in Christ today. But how about his steadfastness? Without steadfastness, none of those things would have taken place. And I just wonder, and I have to ask, not only for myself, but for all of us, I wonder if we've missed anything or missed out on anything because we weren't steadfast in the things of God. I wonder, you know. Or how many things on the other side of the 
you know, equation. How many things will God have for us? How many good things? How many blessed things will God have for us if we then begin to follow him in a steadfast manner? I want to do that. I want us to do that. I, I don't want to be lazy or sleepy, uh, sleeping under some tree. I want to be steadfast for the things of God. Verse 1 says, in fact, look at the steadfastness right from the get-go. Now it came to pass when they had departed from them, and I'll stop right there, because I have found that the words departed from them could literally be translated, we tore ourselves away from them. Can you imagine that? So... I'll use the word bent, probably doesn't fit very well, but Paul the Apostle is so bent on doing the will of God, so committed to doing what it is that God had called him to do, that even when loving people were hugging him, don't go, brother, you know, don't go, that he said, I, I, I've got to. I've, and he had to tear himself away from them even sometimes from good things, you'll have to move away in order to accomplish the will of God for your life. How important is the will of God in your life? Where does it, where does it rate, you know? Steadfastness. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 36, so this is back a chapter, it says, when Paul had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. That's all the elders, the leaders from Ephesus. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. It's been said that we're living in a graceless age. And I was talking to somebody, a, a lot of you know Rich and Delia Allender. They were in our church for a lot of years. And uh, then they moved to Tennessee a few years back. And so I was talking to Rich and I was just asking him, I said, okay, compare for me uh, Tennessee with California. And he used to live here in Long Beach. And uh, so he started saying, oh, there's a lot of hills, very pretty trees. The other day I had 30 deer in my backyard. And I said, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. And he goes, and he kind of chuckles and he goes, you know what else is hard for me to get used to? He says, over here people are nice. <laughs> and I was like, ouch, you know? But... How many of us know very well the person that lives next door to us or on the other side or across the street? You know? We, we usually, we've kind of begun to do this isolation thing and I think the last two plus years now have put us in a mode of isolating. That's probably why, you know, that's probably why the number of suicides have skyrocketed across the country. That isolation is not healthy. It's not good. It's not right for us. And within a church family, and we use that word church family because I want us to consider each other in that manner, that we actually love each other, you know. You know we actually have friendships here, you know, that can last a lifetime. How cool is that? Uh, Pastor Aileen was telling me that uh, he was talking to somebody, and uh, they said, oh, well, uh, how long have you been going to your church? Aileen said, oh, it's been 23 years. And the guy was like, what? You've gone to the same church for 23 years? Who does that? And it's, it's interesting how our culture has really moved us apart when God would move us together. I remember over and over again Jesus' prayer. Father, you just picture Jesus praying, Father, I pray 
that they would be one, just like we're one. Well, we got a ways to go, don't we? But with God's help, that's his plan for us. So it was a touching scene. It was a beautiful scene. Uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, we read, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Don't we know that love can carry us through a lot of hard things, can it? Love can carry us through some deep waters. And indeed, I would say then that love is a fuel for our steadfastness. Don't try to be steadfast. Get filled up with God's love and then move out in that steadfastness. I want you to uh, forget for a moment about what you can do. Uh, forget for a moment about what information you may have collected about the Bible and about God uh, for a number of years. Just dr drop all that for a second. And let me ask you, do the people around you know that you love them? Or is it a mystery? And that was the question the Lord asked me, so I turned around and gave it to you. <laughs> Do the people around you know that you love them? And I hope it's not a mystery. I hope that our lives are not all about self. And I hope that our lives are not all about living the self-life, the self-centered the self-centric life. And so therefore, all my decisions and all my choices and all my values are made on what makes me feel good. <laughs> my friendships are based on what makes me feel good. What if Jesus came here and he said, I want to let you know something. I'm only going to like those people who like me. <laughs> I'm only going to give my life for those people who like me. That's it. You know, one time Jesus said, uh, uh, you say that you uh, love people that are good to you. Uh, what more do you do than anybody else? Even tax collectors do that, you know. <laughs> give them the money and then they're happy. <laughs> don't give them the money and they don't not be very happy. So it really always comes back to that pivot point. And not selfish love, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't want, especially the young adults that we have here, I don't want you to think that, you know, what you're going after is eye candy or somebody who makes you feel good. Why don't you find somebody that loves God more than you do? That's who you should hook yourself up with. Find somebody who wants to practice true friendship with you. And true friendship always leads to God. Always. Otherwise, it's not true friendship. Because there is a kind of love that takes, and then there's the kind of love that gives. Remember my dad sat me down one time and gave me a lesson. He was very short on words, but he would always say these profound things, and then he would just leave it. So he would say, Paul, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are givers, and there are takers. Make sure you're a giver. He walked away. <laughs> How right was he? Pretty right, huh? <laughs> I think the Lord would want us to look at Jesus and say, is Jesus a giver or is Jesus a taker? Oh my goodness. If you follow him, you'll end up being a giver. In fact, you'll end up denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after him daily. That's just what will happen. So, uh, this is just a beautiful scene to me, and I just, I just enjoyed watching it and being there, and you know, in my own little imagination. Uh, Pastor Mike used to call it "use your sanctified imagination" and put yourself in the scene. You know, so I pictured myself praying with Paul the Apostle and Luke, and maybe a few others were there, and 
kneeling down with them and getting a hug from a bro and maybe some worship. Take a look at verse 4. In verse 4, it has Paul the Apostle. Take a look. He has a seven-day layover in the city of Tyre. See that? Apparently, they were making good time. I read that. I said to my wife, I said, Honey, uh, why do you think that Paul stopped in Tyre? And you know what she said? Because he was tired. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love funny little things. So there he finds in Tyre more love and more hospitality. I don't see him there for a sightseeing. I don't see him there on vacation. He's not there to take a rest. He knows what he's doing. He's there to connect. He's there to teach. He's there to pray. In fact, when Jeannie and I travel places, we always look for, you know, we go, what church are we going to go to, you know, when we're on vacation, you know? It's just a blast for us to visit the church anywhere and to worship and to pray with them. That's a big deal for us. In reality, in reality, we are never on vacation from God, right? We are never to let our Bibles get dusty. Now, what fascinates me here in verse 4 is that the believers tell Paul, check this out, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Uh, first off, uh, this is not new to Paul the Apostle. Back in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 again, he says, uh, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, <laughs> saying the chains and tribulations await me. Looks to me like he knew what was going on and what was going to happen where he was going. What if you were stopped by this church and said, hold your horses, you know? Don't take that missionary trip, you know? What are you doing going to that part of the world? You know, that, the Holy Spirit is saying that tribulation awaits you. So you look at this and you go, it seems to be, uh, there's a disconnect somewhere. And for centuries, actually, Christians have argued back and forth. Should Paul the Apostle have gone to Jerusalem? Or should he have found something else to do? Some people say he should not have gone. Other people say he should have gone to Jerusalem. Can I tell you what really counts to me? What really counts to me is the motivation of Paul's heart. The motivation of his heart. He was not going to Jerusalem out of rebellion. He was going out of love. And he decided that love weighed more than the possible difficulties that he would face. Let me give you another thing. I think you'll see it here in a moment. Wherever he would go, the prophecy would come. And the prophecy was, trouble awaits you. <laughs> you know, trouble awaits you. You're chains, you're going to be bound, you're going to be given over to the Gentiles. Not going to be pretty, period. That was the whole prophecy. But then what you would get is the people's reaction to the prophecy. Because it's not going to be pleasant, Oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit's stuck. So Paul, don't go. I think that's what we see going on. Prophecy is a big part of a church family. And more and more of us need to tune in to prophecy. Now prophecy is not only for telling some kind of a future event, but prophecy is just speaking forth the word of God. Something that applies to a part of our life, you know? In fact, I had somebody come to me a few weeks back and they said, hey, there's this cute girl at work and I was kind of wondering if I should pursue that. What do you think? And I said, you need somebody, what, who loves God more than you do. <laughs> if you do that, you'll be okay. Amen? That always works out. So 
That's what you have. You have the word of prophecy and then you have people's reaction to the word of prophecy and there seems to be a difference there. But Paul the Apostle had already been told by the Holy Spirit, I go bound by the Holy Spirit to Jerusalem. I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to follow what God has called me to do. In verse 5, it says, All accompanied us, wives and children, till we went out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Wouldn't you have liked to have been in that group? Wouldn't that have been sweet? You know, there you are on the shore with the Apostle Paul and Luke and the rest of them. And you're on your knees and you're praying. You're seeking God's wisdom and guidance. I'll tell you one thing that the prophecies did for Paul the Apostle. It had everybody praying. Yes, everybody was praying. And that's definitely one thing that was accomplished through those prophecies. Sometimes the Lord will say something like, Hey, Brandon, I think the Lord wants you to do sound for us. Amen? <laughs> or Pow Pow, I think you should help out on the overheads. <laughs> or do you play guitar? <laughs> Sometimes the triggers that God gives us are through other people to bring us along, you know, and to help us get in, in ministry and out of trouble so from place to place, he had saints praying, connecting with the Lord on Paul's behalf. Uh, and tell me all those people on that shore, wasn't that a sign and a symbol to everybody else? Wouldn't you say if you saw a bunch of people kneeling on the shore here in Huntington Beach, what are they doing? <laughs> What's that about, you know? And then you might even ask them, what are you guys doing, you know? Oh, we're praying. Here in the open, this is not a church. <laughs> it's a witness. I would encourage you. Do you do this? Do you do this? Do you invite friends and family over maybe for dinner so that you can pray the gospel? <laughs> I do that he heavy at, at Christmas. <laughs> and Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus, you know. <laughs> and that simple faith in Christ, our sins can be forgiven. Just go for it. Jeannie and I are always uh, at uh, restaurants. Uh, when we're at restaurants, we make sure that everybody notices that we're praying. We love doing that, you know? So I go ahead and stand on the table and I lift my... <laughs> uh, we'll even ask... Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Willis and uh, Ralph and I go to uh, breakfast on uh, Wednesday mornings. And uh, wherever we're at, uh, we asked the waitress, we're about to bless our food. Is there anything we can pray for you for? And we've prayed for weddings, and we've prayed for sicknesses, and we've prayed for all kinds of things. Generally, people are very open to that. You know, generally people are. So go ahead and use your faith wherever you're at. Let's pick it up in verse 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions, I think he's picking up people along the way. I think there's a big group of them now. We who were with Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip. This is going to be so cool when you figure this out. The evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Here's a little bit more about him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters. Some, somebody say, praise God. Amen. Praise God. It is tough. Amen? To keep righteous in a fallen world. But you young people, do it. You'll be blessed on account of it. Amen? Amen. Four virgin daughters who prophesied. They all spoke the word of God. I saw a guy with a t-shirt the other day. It was a guy and his t-shirt says, uh, nothing scares me. And then underneath it, it says, I have two daughters. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we know what that's like. Amen. <laughs> so, all right, Paul with companions goes and stays at Philip's house. Is anybody shocked by that? This is a miracle. I'm telling you right now, this is a miracle. 
uh, it's a shocking statement that Paul stayed with Philip. Philip is an evangelist. He's also designated as one of the seven. I called him the Magnificent Seven. Can you remember them? Back from Acts chapter 6. The Magnificent Seven, what they were, were men who loved the Lord, who wanted to serve the Lord, who wanted no recognition for themselves, and they helped out the widows. Remember? Anybody remember this? Okay. And things were going sweet, and things were going great, until this one guy shows up in Jerusalem, who's a Pharisee, and his name was Saul. Saul shows up, and he says, hey, Give me orders and I'll round up these Christians and I'll either see they're dead or I'm in jail. And he starts rounding up Christians and he's breathing out hatred, Saul of Tarsus, breathing out hatred. As a matter of fact, the very first martyr was one of the seven. His name was Stephen. Stephen was martyred and who approved of his being martyred? Saul approved of his being martyred. And what happened at that point was believers began to scatter out of Jerusalem to escape being put to death or beaten or whatever. And one of them that escaped away was Philip. Philip left Jerusalem based on the persecution brought about by Saul of Tarsus. So now are you surprised at this statement? Paul the Apostle is invited, invited into Philip's house, one of the seven. And he stays there for a long time. And he's treated with love. And he's treated with hospitality. Oh my goodness. I wish I could have been there when Philip talked to his wife and said, Honey, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, she'd say, hey, I got a meal for him. <laughs> you know, love is bigger than anything else. It's bigger than hatred. It's bigger than persecution. It, in fact, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, love is stronger than death. That's how strong love is. You think nobody says no to death and taxes, but... Uh, Love is even stronger than that. That's the thing we need. That's, I, I think if we caught this, how important and how valuable God's love is, every night we would be saying, Lord, fill me with your love. Lord, you know every way this day in how I failed in the love arena. Lord, Fill me with your love. Well, things would have to change in our lives for the better. So never underestimate God's ability to change a life. Changed your life, didn't he? To redeem our lives, to reconstruct our lives. I think Jeannie already mentioned it, that a devotional life with Paul and Jeannie on Spotify. Was it today? Yesterday. Uh, was it yesterday, Abby? Yeah. Abby gave her testimony, so uh, tune in on that. On uh, Thursday, we're going to get Aileen's testimony. Uh, is that right, Aileen? Oh, I'm sorry. On Tuesday, we are. And then on Thursday, we're going to get Daniel's testimony. And then on Saturday, is it Saturday then? Yeah. We're going to get Pow Pow's testimony. Way cool. So tune in on that. If you want to give your testimony on devotional life with Paul and Jeannie, please let us know. And we'll put you on there. That 10-minute slice of heaven. So uh, never underestimate, as I said, the ability of God to change your life. Look at verse 10. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own hands and his feet and he said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the, uh, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt 
and deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. That's the prophecy. Here's their reaction to the prophecy. Now when they heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. They're begging their dear brother Paul not to go up. Man, that must have been something. Paul, here's confirmation. Don't go. I had a gal in a Psalms class that I taught when I was teaching at the Bible college. And she had signed up to take a a missions trip to a very dangerous part of Africa. And the folks in the class were all like, are you sure? Oh, wow. And she was like, I'm going. And that's that. (laughs) And even one of our own sons, uh, not too long after that, took a missions trip to that same place in Africa. And we were trying to talk him out of it. (laughs) Josh, don't go, man. Jeepers, you don't have to go, but just pray for those that are going. We didn't want him to go. Jeannie knows that. But he said, no, I really believe that God has spoken to me that I'm to go to Africa. And so he went, which caused us the entire time to what? To pray for him, you know? And uh, God was gracious and kind and brought him back and even had video of him uh, teaching uh, a Sunday uh, service. And uh, the folks in church were dancing and clapping and jumping. And it was just beautiful. It was really something to see. So I think Paul the Apostle had that same kind of thing. I know how you feel. I know you think that I shouldn't go, but God has told me to go. Uh, Let's see, Uh, verse uh, 13. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. And isn't that really what we want in all of our lives? The will of the Lord be done. Paul was far more interested in the gospel being preached than he was interested in being in his own comfort. And I remember years ago at a pastor's conference, one of the pastors got up and he looked around the room at us and he said, I want each of you to know that God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. And I remember I had to sit with that for quite a while. I had to like let that soak in. That some of the harshest things that have happened in my life have worked out for the good and have built within me a resilience and a steadfastness to follow God no matter what. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, New Living, it says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 15. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manassan of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. We got Paul to Jerusalem, didn't we? Now we're going to see what it is that happens next. Church family, as we close, I just want to tell you this. It is always too soon to quit. The road of this life is not an easy one. It wasn't easy for Paul the Apostle nor for that matter was it easy for our Savior, the Lord Jesus. But we as God's sons and daughters can draw on Christ's power and our love relationship with him. Real quick, there was one other person who set his face like flint steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, 
even though he knew the suffering that was ahead of him. Who was that? That was Jesus. It said he steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem, going there, knowing that he would die and suffer for our sins. Again, Psalm 57, verse 7, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time in your word where, Lord, my conscience was touched by this. Do I have that kind of love? Do I have that kind of resolve? Lord, can I please have these things from you? Father, will you build into me a steadfastness so that I don't back down, so that I'm resilient in the face of insults or whatever comes? Lord, when I think things are unfair, will I still be steadfast? Lord, help me not to give up in this race. I want to finish my race, and I want to do it in a steadfast manner. For, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. All my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen.